Welcome, everybody. Greetings. And we're so glad you're here. Um, on behalf of the Digital Equity Laboratory, welcome to the future of data justice, community power, and data-driven systems with Research and Organizing Collective, our data bodies. Uh, my name is Greta Byram, and along with my co-director, Maya Wiley, I run the New School's Digital Equity Laboratory, hosted by the Milano School of Policy, Management, and the Environment. The Digital Equity Lab uncovers and addresses structural inequities that persist and evolve as technology transforms our cultural, social, and political systems. And welcome to our youngest attendee over here. This is Mariella's um, child. Um, so what do we mean by digital equity? This is one of the most common questions that I get um, as co-director of the laboratory. And um, I just want to give uh, four of our working principles um, that begin to outline um, our vision of digital equity. Number one, digital equity treats technology as a tool and not a determination, solution, or an end in itself. Number two, digital equity takes a structural, transdisciplinary, and intersectional approach. Number three, digital equity aims to build a collective cultural of digital consent and mutual accountability shaped by and for the benefit of the most vulnerable among us. Number four, digital equity builds towards technological systems that reflect the best society we can collectively imagine now and in the future. So I bring those four principles as a way to open up this space um, and to um, set our sights towards a positive vision for technology. I can't think of a better way to actualize our mission and our principles than by hosting our data bodies here today to celebrate the release of their digital defense playbook. And you'll hear more about that today. Um, this is what it looks like, and we're so excited it's out. Since 2015, ODB, as our data bodies is known, um, has been working in Charlotte, Detroit, and Los Angeles to collect the stories of communities grappling with the power of data-driven automated technology systems, especially how those systems disproportionately impact marginalized communities. ODB takes a participatory approach in their research, organizing and working collectively from within communities to understand people's real experiences of getting lost in the power maze of big data, how this relates to the kinds of exclusion and marginalization certain communities experience much more than others, and to build collective strategies of self-defense. Most importantly, when virtually all of the news we're hearing these days is bad, and especially when it comes to technology, I am so grateful to ODB for their extraordinary generosity in not only naming the problems and telling the stories of our increasingly data-driven world, but also for flipping the script to offer a vision and tools for organizing around a new vision. Today we're celebrating their digital defense playbook and their many years of work in this area. Um, and they will be offering you real, useful, on-the-ground activities and tools that your community can use to shape your own tech relationship with technology. So I'm going to pause here and just give you some information so that you're safe and comfortable in this space. There are bathrooms. If you go out these exits in the back and you go um, around the corner and downstairs, um, there are bathrooms. And then um, for anybody who needs an accessible bathroom, go ahead out the doors um, towards the front desk and um, the guard there can let you into an accessible bathroom on this floor. Um, I also want to do some housekeeping and just thank um, Mozilla for their support um, today. Um, I want to uh, thank the Open Society Foundations for their support of the Digital Equity Laboratory. I want to thank Holly Dowell who has helped me um, in every way to put this event together. Thank you, Holly. And most of all, I want to thank ODB for coming here all the way from all of your respective places um, and, and for bringing your collective genius to um, the new school. So our data bodies, I'm just going to talk about who's, who's sitting here. Um, we have um, first Kim, uh, Kim M. Reynolds, 
who is a master's student. Actually, you're a postdoc, right? No, master's student. Master's student, okay. At the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And she's a freelance writer and a community and arts organizer and a music lover, um, sitting at the intersection of art, politics, community, and justice. Um, next is Tamika Lewis, who is a black queer mother and community organizer focused on advancing queer people of color and marginalized communities towards liberation through the dismantling of capitalism and all its forms of currency. Next is Mariella Saba, who's a Palestinian and Mexican queer mother born and raised in Los Angeles, where she dedicates her life to community organizing, popular education, cultural work, and healing arts to collectively and creatively contribute to all of life's interconnected liberation. Um, next down there is uh, Tawana Honeycomb Petty, who is a mother, anti-racist social justice organizer, author, and poet, born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. And on the end is Sita Pena Gangadaran, a Filipino Indian mother and research justice organizer born in New Jersey and currently living and teaching in London. Sita, who is um, also the co-founder and um, principal investigator for our data bodies, is an assistant professor in the Department of Media and Communication at the London School of Economics. And um, this semester, we're also lucky enough to have her as a visiting scholar here in the New School's um, School of Media Studies. So Sito is going to give some introductory remarks next. And um, please join me in welcoming our data bodies to the New School. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you, Greta and Digital Equity Lab um, for hosting us today. Thank you to the School of Media Studies for inviting me as a visiting scholar this semester. Um, I'd also like to thank Liberate for translating the Digital Defense Playbook and also too for designing it. Um, and uh, I also have to give some credit to the Department of Media and Communications at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, Mozilla Foundation, Media Democracy Fund, Institute of International Education and Digital Trust Foundation for supporting us over the years. Sam, a resident of Detroit and one of the 137 people we interviewed over the past um, three years once said, I don't think I've surrendered to the fact that they're just gonna do what they're gonna do. I don't think I've surrendered to the fact that they're just gonna do what they're gonna do. And in the short time that I have, um, I want to reflect um, on the spirit of Sam's words and honor their gumption by uh, broadly setting the stage for our work. And I wanna do this in two ways. I first wanna distinguish our data bodies from other efforts focused on data collection, data-driven systems, and all of the things that are related to that, algorithms, AI, smart cities. So I want to distinguish our work um, from those efforts. And secondly, I want to introduce the idea of refusal as a framework for understanding the strategies and tactics for dealing with data-driven systems. Um, which we have learned from the many people we've talked to over the course of our research and organizing in Charlotte, Detroit, and Los Angeles. So first, our data bodies, when we originally started, we were responding to uh, a call for proposals for research on privacy and populations of low socioeconomic status. Um, that was the CFP that was put out by the Digital Trust Foundation. And what we settled on and what we um, have really grown into is a research and organizing project that combines systematic analysis with community conversation and community building. Our work is inherently intersectional, so we consider economic exploitation, cultural subordination, racism, powerlessness, structural violence, and marginalization in relation to data collection and data-driven systems. And we envision ourselves 
as already in alignment with networks and movements for racial, economic, and social justice. While some in the academy and increasingly in industry look at fairness in machine learning, we're interested in justice and equity and human experience. And while others concentrate on harms and a legalistic approach to redressing those harms, we're attuned to pain, people's pain in experiencing what it's like to be treated as a data point and become part of a looping cycle of injustice. Equally so, I might add that we're also attuned to joy and love that people have articulated us. It's a faith in, in, in human relationships and uh, there's an impetus to restore and strengthen those relationships. So when I think of what ODB is, we're happy to dip into technical and legal and ethical conversations, and we are happiest when we are working and thinking and working um, towards the health and strength of marginalized groups. Second, a key facet of our work, which we're here today to celebrate, focuses on generating power, not paranoia. And as I reflected on this, um, another way of thinking about the kind of power that has manifested itself in the conversations and the work over the years is a power of refusal. And here I'm, I'm partly drawing on the work of Ruha Benjamin, who's talked about informed refusal, and I completely agree with her. When people, talk, when people we've talked to mention strategies and tactics they've used to withstand the coercive technologies of surveillance um, and the systems of, systems of social control that go with that, or to withstand the withering effects intended by pervasive data collection, or even to affirmatively use data or data-driven technologies. We're refusing to accept data-driven systems in the terms and conditions that governments and corporations present to us. Instead, people we've talked to are engaged in a form of self-creation that offers an alternative vision of how the world can be. So when we hear Sam say, I don't think I've surrendered to the fact that they're just going to do what they're going to do, this is refusal. This is a statement of generativity, of moving forward, an energy that organizers recognize as movement opportunity. And in that spirit, I'd like to turn to my colleagues, um, and we'll hear more about ODB and organizing. Thank you. Peace, everyone. Peace. I say peace because I come in peace, and I hope you do too. So I'm Tawana, also known as Honeycomb, and um, I've had the honor of serving as a part of this collaborative family, I can call them family now, over the last several years in thinking about how to bring community members' voices into the fold of digital and data justice. Um, and so I'll continue to move in the spirit that Sita um, started with in the, um, the concept of refusal. So I want to lift up uh, Renita in Detroit who said, my cell phone is a prepaid cell phone. I don't have a contract, so there is no true tie back to my identity. Wherever I can, I minimize giving away some or any of my information. I avoid as many contracts as possible, and I do a lot of direct channel transactions if I can. I don't think there's anything that you can really do, though, to secure yourself. And so with all of that, with all of the different forms of resistance that Renita has um, 
br brought into her work and her organizing and how she lives and functions as a being, she still feels insecure. And so um, I'm in a city, uh, Detroit, which essentially 40% uh, of the city doesn't have access to broadband internet infrastructure, as an example. But the community members still feel very much connected. <laughs> um, the systems are connected to them whether or not they have access to those systems. And so um, uh, even though community members aren't necessarily always using surveillance as, um, as the language, they can tell you very clearly that they feel like they're being watched. Um, we're in a city um, that for about a half century has had a particular dominant narrative, a particular uh, propaganda narrative, if you will. Um, and I could even poll the audience right now, if I were to ask you if you're 50 years or under, if you had a particular perception of Detroit, um, and I wouldn't have to tell you what that is, but if I were to ask you, if you had a particular perception of t Detroit until maybe about three or four years ago, how many would raise your hands? Right. And so what happens is when you've been inundated with a particular narrative, sometimes you opt into systems um, that you feel are going to offer some kind of a protection for you because you've been uh, indoctrinated into a kind of ideology that says that these systems are the only way to feel safe. And so one of the things that we do in Detroit through our work is try to drive home um, the difference between what safety and what security is. Um, safety is knowing who your neighbors is. Safety is recreation centers. Safety is having access to schools. Safety are those types of things. Security is surveillance and, and militarization and cameras and systems, and most times they don't make you safe. And so one of the biggest parts of being part of ODB, um, our Data Bodies Project, is using this information as a way to politicize community members in recognizing what the difference is between safety and security so they can make informed decisions around which systems they can opt in and opt out of. And if they can't, if they are forced to consent to particular systems, then what are some mechanisms that we can utilize to minimize the harms? And so um, the, I'll leave it there um, and not talk too much longer because I love to hear from you all any um, questions. But I hope you'll pick up our playbook. I hope you'll um, teach it in community. I hope you'll expand upon it, um, offer up suggestions, ideas. Um, this is three years worth of work, but we know we have a long way to go. Um, and we need to do it collectively with you all. And so thank you for joining us today. Hello, hello. Awesome. I want to get closer. Um, this is what it's also about, connecting and seeing each other and noticing the structures that we're in right now, right now, in the new school and the feeling and the vibes that that gives us and the separation and the divides. So I want to break some of that right now. Um, and yeah, I'm just leaning up closer so I could stay with my crew here because I want to honor all the places we're coming from and that we were right here and we're sharing and caring from, we're actually carrying a lot of stories and people. Um, and there's, I want to acknowledge that I was able to travel here. I want to acknowledge my baby present in the room making all the sounds that are necessary to, to make getting free together here with my sibling, who's also here taking care of my um, Samira. I'm just, yeah, I'm naming you some, and I love you, I love you all. And um, I was born in Los Angeles. I'm carrying folks from there, and I also want to lift up a voice from Los Angeles in a moment now, but I want to ask you first um, if you can help honor the indigenous people of, of this land as we just arrived here last night. 
And um, when we said the new school is on this land right here and the structure we're in, we need to remember what land we're on. So I want to turn to you folks. Can somebody please help us honor and name the indigenous people of this land? And out loud if it feels good or internally, however, but we want to hear a name. Lenape. Lenape? Lenape. I want to honor the Lenape people of this land. Uh, I want to name the genocide, the pain, the violence. Um, as Sita was naming, we are in tune with the pain and the healing. Um, So with permission from Lanape and everybody before us that made this space and event possible, I'm going to bring in Hatman's voice into the room, um, Mr. Wesley, who rests in power now. And that's why I want, I want to bring him into the space. I had the honor to interview him in Skid Row before we interviewed, we were already friends organizing at Los Angeles Community Action Network with Stop LAPD Spying Coalition and all the other formations that Hatman was part of in his life, uh, elder black man from Florida, born in Florida. What's the price of me having my records expunged? After that, where do we go from here? You going to still neglect to forgive me, or you going to not forgive me? Is it going to count against other things I'm going to do in life to get ahead? A little bit from Hatman, uh, elder black man in Skid Row, a veteran of war, and we'll just let his voice speak for himself. We have a couple things to name while we're here. We're going to take advantage of having traveled here all together from all the many places. Um, and so thank you for the space to share words and things we've been learning and need to share. Happy to name Collective Liberation and um, grounded in the fact that we are not free all together. Uh, grounded in the fact that we have a bunch of prisons, cages globally, and this work is lifting that truth. Um, there are many ways that we're not free, and some bodies more than other bodies. So our project is called Our Data Bodies Project, and what we're centering are our bodies, our lived experiences, yeah, our truths our stories in, in the face of an ever more increasing um, oppression that is uh, e ever more disconnected, ever more computerized, and heavily uh, weaponized. So when Hatman names, you know, are they going to use it against me? It's because um, Hatman comes from a lineage of attacks. So when we talk about defense, we ha we're talking about the context of being attacked. I um, want to lift up and then transition to my dear friend, colleague, co-worker, co-organizer across the land, Tamika. Um, and want to share with folks about Pedro Echeverria, a young person in my neighborhood who um, was being targeted by the police. I'm naming LAPD. Uh, we're in the patrolled lands. Of, um, these lands that we're, we're honoring, these sacred lands are being patrolled here by NYPD, etc., and all the different systems that are interconnected in the culture of policing that we're naming. Well, that's happening heavily in LA. And um, the militarization, the, the military force that they are, it's not just the increasing militarization, but it's naming that it is an uh, occupying force. Um, yeah, they, they've been attacking and killing young people, killing black people, killing brown people. And this is what we're naming and lifting here, the, these truths that we know that um, we have 
we continue to resist and are in movement in. So I'll be continuing to share about Pedro's story throughout our talk today, but I want to share that he survived being shot by LAPD June 2017. And in a longer story, fast forward short to March 11th, a couple weeks ago, he was in court um, ready for trial. Um, the system will flip the violence on you, blame you, and incarcerate you and impact all our mental health. And so Pedro was facing assault on an officer charges um, and gang enhancement. So we want to name all these things so we could talk about all those scary gang narratives, those scary narratives about Detroit that Tawana's naming, about black people, brown people, indigenous people. Um, that's, those are the, the, the narratives and the structures that were, that are, that got built on those um, that we're in. And they got computer screens now, and uh, we got to acknowledge all that, folks, because uh, Pedro got forced into a guilty plea Monday, March 11th. And if we look inside the prisons, most everybody, everybody got forced into a, a guilty plea. These are data-driven systems, another way of saying profit-driven systems, racism-driven systems patriarchy-driven systems. Um, and the division is clear when you go to the restroom. You know, um, the journey you gotta take and the divide in the patriarchy and the, yeah, I, I wanna just name that. I'm gonna just plant, plant a seed for the more patriarchy conversations we're about to have. I'll pass it on. Thanks, y'all. The worst thing I ever heard was, you probably should give up on finding a job. He was like, I don't even know why you came here today, because you know you got a background. You know it's recent. And you know most places aren't going to hire you. So you probably should just stop trying. Go to school or something, cream. So I'm not born and raised in North Carolina. Um, I was actually born in New York, but I generously have been granted the opportunity to work in North Carolina for the last six years organizing. Um, and I ground our work in the spirit of North Carolina within the black radical tradition of refusing major systems, refusing patriarchy, white supremacy, um, and really digging down into creating a new. A lot of the narratives that's going around, around um, especially some scholarly narratives around data-driven systems, digital surveillance, technology, is that it's neutral, right? That the math is neutral. But what happens when the people who are creating the math are not neutral? What happens when there's unaddressed anti-blackness, anti-immigrant, anti-poverty, right? Anti, <laughs> it's not, anti it's very patriarchal, right? And so what happens when all of that is embedded into systems that are now dictating the way people have the ability to self-determine? That is what Kareem is naming, right? It wasn't a system or data that stopped him from getting that job. It was the person standing in front of his face and basically telling him that he was not wor worth a paycheck, like that he was not worth the time, the effort, the intentional, energy exchange of being there just because he had a background. And what we heard in North Carolina and similarly what we've heard in all of the cities is that it's the people who are making the decisions, who control and protect the systems, the protectors of patriarchy, the protectors of capitalism um, that are really stopping our ability to self-determine. And so, um, automated systems in this moment, we know represent what we are dealing with now in this political moment in America and then globally, right? This constant fight and war around what's valid and what's not, what can bring us capital, right? And what will bring us joy. Um, and so I wanna ground our work in the refusal to let these systems continue to exist, the refusal to let prisons stand, the refusal to even switch prisons from bo brick and mortar to home and security, home and community with digital 
bracelets, right? These movements have like, the system has co-opted our language, right? Like, you don't want prisons? Great, you don't get a prison, we're gonna close them all down, but we're gonna make sure Kareem can't leave his house, right? He can't leave four or five blocks. Um, we're gonna make sure that all of the folks there will, have, will be monitored continuously. Right now, Charlotte is, um, will be hosting the new RNC, the Republican National Convention this year, and we already hosted the DIM NC, right? Um, and what that comes like, vast militarization, vast tools of policing and monitoring, and we saw it during the uprising, right? Like that folks were prepared and equipped to go to war with folks, with us, with the community on the ground when we are tired of being shot, we are tired of being killed, we are tired of being murdered. Um, and what they do, they turned around and used surveillance footage um, of folks on the ground in our Facebook feeds to pick people up, um, geo tags to really like hone in and like count who was there, our algorithms and likes of each other's posts to be able to start picking and attacking folks up. We have like freedom fly, fly, fighters like Glow who just got arraigned, um, but Raekwon Borum just got committed um, for committing murder that the CMPD committed. Uh, and so it's just like, what are, what are we committed to as a community, as a collective, um, as folks hopefully grounded in anti-blackness and creative change? Um, how are we going to use these data-driven systems? One, at, like, as technologists, as researchers, as academics, to start creating the new narrative, to start creating the new tools, right? What if a, algor a data algorithmist person like created algorithms to predict white supremacy inside of police departments, right? Like you can't get hired because you got a high rating on this algorithm. Who would be really mad at that? <laughs> I wouldn't. <laughs> um, how are we as philanthropists, funders and donors and people with access with money advocating for um, the creation of new tech startups um, with black and brown or data scientists who come and guilt from the communities we seek to produce, right? How are we going to start fighting the narrative that white cisgendered patriarchal men are the only ones that can create valid information, valid algorithms, data science language that tells us how we should live our lives? Um, and so we refuse all of those narratives because we know that it's not true and that we are the majority of the folks who get to move and live and thrive and that we deserve um, the ability to self-determine and self-govern. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Kim, and I joined the ODB team um, just about a year ago, so I wasn't involved in all of the interviewing processes. But what I was uh, involved in, and I think the ethos of ODB is this um, beautiful thing of knowledge production. Um, and I think, as shared from the sentiments that everyone has kind of talked about, we see ourselves in alignment with movements for race, class, gender, and justice movements with an emphasis on centering marginalized voices and creating knowledge in a collaborative and accessible way. Um, and so I'll also be sharing um, a quote from one of our interviewees, um, Sam from Detroit, who said, no, I'm not feeling all that secure. Some of the way I'm feeling is because I don't fully understand the technology. And, um, I think the strength of the work of speaking with people and doing this kind of work is indeed uh, building systems of knowledge and our sh with our shared orientation and understanding that there is the, the social world order of subjugation that targets those of black, of working class, of queer, of women, of differently abled, of citizenship statuses that are precarious in the definition of the state. Um, and as such, an affirmatively anti-racist, anti-oppression stance allows for the creation of knowledge that begins to center us and understand our systems of power. So as Tamika was just saying, how do we understand these existing systems that reproduce our already existing systems of oppression? How, how is AI already targeting, um, already targeting black people? How is that already happening? Um, and so as such, uh, the uh, ODB has published several blog posts, which is something I, um, all of us have been involved in in terms of um, in terms of creating knowledge around who are data brokers, um, who are these people that buy third buy part, uh, buy information from Facebook from Twitter, repackage it and sell it to the police to build predictive policing apparatuses. Um, and one of the things that Sita touched on was this framework of power, not paranoia. 
a, <laughs> no worries, um, this framework of power, not paranoia, and the importance of doing an oral history of that. So um, it was coined and created by members of the ODB coalition as well as the Stop LAPD spying coalition. And in documenting creation of the network, we can start to understand the core idea, um, which is to fundamentally combat and oppose systems and ideologies that are rooted in the disposition, dispossession of community power, or in other words, creating anxiety around general otherness, which obviously comes with its very violent implications. Um, and so from there, with having this oral history with knowing each other's contributions in this way, um, it, be, it can become applicable on many levels. It can become applicable in these spaces where we're talking, maybe in theorizing scholarly spaces, whatever, whatever, but it also becomes very accessible and powerful on an organizing level, which is where most of, a lot of us are grounded. Um, so understanding how do we work with our communities to build power and not paranoia um, and in all those different ways. Um, so yeah, further, I think just these kinds of things, I think the playbook is a, is a really, hopefully, a good comp contribution to our, our ongoing struggle of producing knowledge. Um, and it, it, it can hopefully be used in these ongoing struggles and, uh, and identifying data collection and constructing structures that resist and build around, um, as we said, kind of with an abolitionist framework. So yeah, I think that's, that's it. Hey, Samika, did you want to say something? Oh, usually I just want to bust out in a rap, like, mic check, one, two, <laughs> one, two. I do have one thing to um, add, though, <laughs> is that I think as we look at the, our respective cities, that is no coincidence that throughout the history we have all experienced an uprising, right? Um, which really represents not only the material conditions of our folks, but the the zeal around trying to get to freedom, right? And our commitment to being able to be like, we, so, we tired of being sick and tired, so, yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. <laughs> this is our future when we're talking about the future of data justice. Um, we are, yeah, we're not talking about a, a data future is what I'm hoping, I'm ta we're talking about uh, Re refusing and reducing all of that. Yeah, so that <laughs> Yoali's nature is to connect, um, to see, to make eye contact, to check in, you know, and that's just a reminder of um, what we're trying to heal, back, heal. <laughs> um, there's a lot of uh, disconnection that's happening, so. Um, how, yeah, so I'm gonna just start countering on. that. Yeah, no, it's okay. Um, Greta, you have to go for it. Did you want to yeah, say something? I just wanted to invite, I'm going to open up the floor and invite folks to, um, if you have a question, to come, come on up to um, the microphones that are up here, and folks can line up in the aisles here. Um, and I, I can kick stuff off with a question as people think about what they what they want to know from our data bodies. Um, so I will start with just asking you guys about data, because I feel like when we're talking about data, we're talking about so many different things, right? Because um, data-driven systems that are automated, that are kind of constantly sucking up our data as we move through spaces or as we use the internet, um, that's one kind of data. And then you guys, um, speaking of knowledge production, you've created a very rich and deep collection of data, but it's a very different kind of data. Um, and so I really wanted to just dive into that question about our data bodies and why you all have chosen um, this method of storytelling um, as, as a way of building a knowledge base and, and making a decision about the kind of data that you're collecting. Tawan, it looks ready. <laughs> <laughs> and well, y'all come line up while, while um, folks are speaking, feel free. Well, I know definitely, um, um, I'll speak as a Detroit perspective, um, you know, thinking about uh, data in a way that uplifts the tremendous contributions that community members have made, number one, to 
all the systems that exist, but um, they've unfortunately um, made those contributions in a forced way. Um, and also, a lot of times, community members don't see the value in all the things that have been extracted from them. Um, and so, in the shift from paranoia to power, um, hopefully um, encouraging community members, number one, through things like um, looking at the open data portals as an example, those things exist in the community, but a lot of community members don't know that they exist. So there's over 2,600 open data portals in the US, and most places I go, um, including in Detroit, residents don't know that there's a portal that's full of data and information with information about them, um, information about organizations in their community, information about property um, and different things. Um, and a lot of times uh, these portals are developed in a way that focus from a security mindset. And so when you look at a portal and it says public safety, it's policing. It's, it's where's there, you know, a camera, a, a business that has a, a, a surveillance camera so that you can feel quote unquote safe. And so looking at data in all the ways, offline, online, um, and how we can utilize it to be empowered. And so um, I do want to encourage folks to go to DetroitCommunityTech.org and look at the research pa resource page. And there's an opening data one zine and an opening data two zine. And so um, you'll get a full breadth of like how we're looking at data in Detroit um, and some of the ways in which we um, use to politicize community members around the different forms that data takes. Um, and during our interviews, we also did workshops. So I did um, various workshops with uh, community members and returning citizens at the um, CCT. And uh, we asked what what data was, right? And it's gossip, it's your Facebook post, it's your biometrics, it's your zip code and your geography and your area code, it's your credit score, it's your background, it is open data portals, it's your wallet, it's all of the information that was collected about you to get the items that are in your wallet, um, it's your phone, it's our stories, right? It's all, this data is this interconnected, interwoven, intentionally ambiguous thing, right? Because um, how do you fight or push back on a thing that you can't actually touch? Um, that's that. And then I think to answer your second question around like why this type of research, um, right before we started this project, I had the opportunity to sit um, at a research, kind of like a pre-launch of our research proposals. I was only one of three black folks in the space. Um, and all of the research was around black and poor people. <laughs> and I remember the one gentleman did, um, his research was on Harlem courting in the digital age and was looking at black youth, right? And I'm a black youth from Harlem was like, I'm going to this one. Um, <laughs> and, and it just was very interesting, the shape of the room. Um, and uh, to be like, this is wrong, right? You don't have any, your gender analysis of what's happening is incorrect. Your social context of what's happening is incorrect, and more so you are pegging black women, young black women as like being gangs or like having cliques that are abusive without actually thinking about the social and cultural norms that go into why people are responding, right? And then when asked, who in this room actually represents any of the communities that they yield from or that they're doing research, it was none. Probably one other person besides myself. Um, and then when we talked about technology and, well, privacy, there was this assumption that everyone is, has the same amount of privacy and that just poor folks weren't opting into it, that we wanted to like blast our stuff all over Facebook or we wanted to have our um, information read, right? Or if we didn't want to not, if we wanted to get jobs then we would stop doing risky behavior. I was like, actually that risky behavior is survival. <laughs> um, and so for us as community organizers at the intersection of academic research and um, 
health and healers, right? It was like, how do we prioritize and uplift the stories of the communities that we come from? How do we start with producing a tool that folks can go back into the communities and use right away instead of producing the kind of typical jargon heavy report around this is what's happening with poor black people when we talk about data collection because who does that actually serve? Mostly our egos. Um, and so that's kind of why we structured the project in the way that we did. Great, and Sita, I see you have a, maybe something to say, but I just wanted to say first, um, so um, if, if you guys have not had the opportunity um, to see some of these interviews, it's our data, uh, odbproject.org, right? OD, odbproject.org, um, and check out the interim report um, on that page, which, which includes um, a number of the interviews. And you said, what's the total number of interviews you guys have done? Total number is 137. So it's just a lot. It's a lot of interviews. <laughs> it's, a lot. it's a lot. We can talk about that too. <laughs> um, but just the only thing that I would add really quickly is um, it was really important um, that this be an organizing project. Um, because I think that the way that research is typically done is it comes from, you know, an elite institution or an institution that has elite power, um, and then it stays in the institution in that particular epistemic community. And what we see, I think, is really different with ODB, where we have truly, I mean, we have become a family, right? We have all of the fights of a family. <laughs> Um, and, you know, we're walking in different spaces at the same time as we're walking with each other. And that feels really good. Like, it's not just an academic project. Um, though, again, like, I am happy to enter into a debate with somebody talking about fairness, accountability, and transparency and algorithms. Like, I can do that. But that's not the only conversation that needs to take place. Great, we have a question right here. Great. Thank you guys so much for coming to New York and sharing and bringing your books and bringing your kiddo. Um, I hoped you could share two things. Um, one, you all have great organizing practices in each of your cities around um, technology as a tool for oppression. So I was hoping you could share um, those practices in your city. And then also I wanted to know how engaging in this um, process of community-based research has changed the organizing or has grown it in a different way or where you want that to evolve going into the future? Hello, hello, cool. Yoali's asleep now. Um, but the mic, is a, it's our first time doing this with the mic. So we'll see how it goes. Um, thank you, where did the person go? Hey, thank you for sharing the question. Um, and thank you for naming practice. Um, what are we practicing in our communities? Um, I wasn't too clear on what, on technology as a tool for oppression, what our organizing practices are. Um, I just wanted to be, be clear about that, or what you just, meant by Just like the work that Stop LAPD Spying has been doing in the community, in the Detroit digital justice community. Yeah. Because that's, I don't think we have that base of organizing mm. in New York or in most other cities that's really special. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, we've been uh, exposing, is a big part of our work is, um, folks who are directly being attacked and impacted are part of their part of their healing and organizing processes to dig at who what is attacking me and not do it alone because all of these systems of control and oppression and data collection um, have an isolating effect so it is important that we organize that. Um, if we were interviewing people on an individual level, it was so that we could um, hold space, open, open questions, open wounds, and not just open them, but let's carry the intergenerational work of addressing them and healing them. 
So it's powerful to find out who and what is, um, what is behind my pain, my attacks, and um, yeah, not do that alone. So yes, expo a lot of work exposing and sharing, um, building knowledge with each other, knowing that it's not an isolated um, or remarkable or unique, exp you know, it is, um, it's not just an, it's not just the, out of the blue that this is happening in LA. This is grounded in all the things we were naming earlier and it's global. Um, so we are, the other piece around organizing is being courageous and together and keeping each other safe, taking care. Because we're lifting and naming uh, very interconnected systems of violence. In LA, it's our duty to name that Israel and LAPD kick it together and think about how we're gonna kill kids. Uh, how are we going to kill the gang, scary youth looking kids that are kicking it in the park and the, the Palestinian children trying to get free? So we are doing this, being courageous, um, holding a space, um, not really receiving co-optation or foundational or different um, funds too that can sway the work, but still needing to sustain the work and grateful for for um, support, so the, those, those playbooks too, it helps to put some donations down. That's the way the work also carries. Um, and we could continue to have this conversation um, beyond this point right now. So happy to, con um, that's how organizing happens. This is beyond this little stage moment that's happening here and you all are watching, it's like um, break the spectator screens that happen in person and digitally and connect and let's talk about how we get free. So I just wanted to say yeah. because of Stop LAPD spying's work, like I know about the militarization of the police in Los Angeles and the mm -hmm. use of fusion centers mm -hmm. and the kinds yeah. of data that those collect and that's due to that work mm -hmm. and the Thank way you. that this coalition has lifted up that work mm -hmm. um, by bringing those pieces together. So that's I think that's what you're seeing with exposure um, and I think it's similar mm -hmm. to what Tawana, what you guys are doing with exposing Project Greenlight, and I'm sure there's something yeah. similar in Charlotte, but um, yeah. that exposure piece is so important. I see we have another question here. Did anybody else want to talk about um, what, in particular, what organizing you do around technology and its oppressive force before we turn to this question? Um, I can come back to that after. Okay, Tawana, so I shall come back, so please. Thank you. Uh, this mic is so close to stage, I feel like this is very intimate. Um, um, so uh, my question is specifically around, you know, digital protection or kind of consumer protection. So um, I've been working in the kind of immigrant justice space for uh, about four or five years. And uh, um, I find that a lot of the actors in the collection of this kind of broad, ambiguous data that you all mentioned, um, are often advocates or kind of nonprofits or organizers like myself. You know, I want to know um, that this person I spoke to on the ground, this person who may have kind of precarious um, status or undocumented status, I want to know how I can reach them later. I want to know what their name is. I want to know if they have dependents. And often I, as well as the organizations I've worked for in the past, collect this data kind of really precariously. and. You know, we have all these like ambitious ideas of how to protect these people, but in the interim, we're storing it in Google Sheets, mm -hmm. or you know, we're creating databases to bolster our own strategies. But these databases are just databases. So how do I? And um, you know, I've had these conversations in the past. I wonder if you've seen stories or narratives that have worked to convince organizations like the ones perhaps you're imagining in your head, or the ones I've worked for. Um, you know, who have very limited resources themselves to also prioritize server security and data security, you know, especially when they're like, we need to allocate funds to organizers. How do you also say, you know, this like intangible IT needs to be funded? Thank you. I like to, to answer that because it also ties into the first question, right? So a way that our organizing in Detroit has changed, especially through Detroit Digital Justice Coalition, Detroit Community Technology Project, has been to minimize 
how much information we collect from people just in general as a practice and to sit down and thoroughly think about and that's something you know that the consciousness that was raised through doing this project is to sit down and think about what is the bare minimal information that we need from people in order to do whatever it is we want to do to make an impact um, because you're right, you go into this process, you want to be helpful, you want to make sure that you're leveraging the stories and the, and the information to um, create these systems of resistance, as an example. But, you, but you're right, um, it makes sense to be as careful as possible and to minimize how much information you collect. And I will say through our Data Bodies project, we were very careful, we anonymize all the quotes that you see. Those are not folks' identities, those are pseudonyms. Um, I also say that we use systems that are encrypted um, and, uh, and, and take very cautious care in how information is tracked. Not using Google, not having them email us, not even uh, um, exchanging phone numbers in most instances. And so there was a lot of care. I mean, of course, nothing's perfect, but throughout this organizing process, the consciousness has been raised in Detroit to like, how do we minimize? Um, and then we went through an entire organizational um, restructuring and um, t uh, training for how to better encrypt and uh, secure all of our systems in our office. And so that happened through the conscious, greater consciousness. Because we're an organization, like I said, in Detroit, where 40% of the city doesn't have access to broadband. But we're very clear that access comes with a lot. And so we have to be thinking about in our organizing around access through our equitable internet initiative and those sorts of things to bring inner people into internet. Then how do we teach them consent? How do we teach them responsible stewardship of information? How do we teach them to be um, thinking about safety and not function from a security mindset, which then we tend to add things that create harm. And so we have ongoing learning. We organize what's called data discotheques, short, um, short for discovering technology, where we raise the consciousness of community members through each of the districts on a regular basis. And so those are the ways that I like to tie what you're talking about into um, how we've started to learn and grow from this process and the stories from our community members. Yeah, I think that the doing the pre-trainings with community members, if you're advocating for more digital inclusion and asking the hard questions around like, you Google, you wanna come. What, what data will y'all be collecting and setting, and setting the president instead of just allowing and accepting? And as like frontline community organizers, having a space on your follow-up sheet for a synonym or pseudonym if someone wants to have it, and that's what goes into your Google spreadsheet if you have to. And that like organizing 101, you still have your sheets, you still follow it with them, and that people are using them and pulling them back up to make their calls to people, but in the system, they're kind of coded, um, you know? So sometimes you'll get like, Big Mama. You'll be like, who is Big Mama? And sometimes that's just really her community name anyway. So when you call her Big Mama, you are helping to build that relationship um, that's not just transactional. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, I, a lot of thoughts, and I look forward to talking more together. Um, a couple pieces, though, is just generally building a culture of care and building relationships so that people themselves can say, this is what feels good, um, opening spaces like that. How are we going to, yeah, how are we gonna name, respect each other? So just, that has to just be the daily work of building, building that. Um, and then the powerful, um, what, we, what we were sharing earlier, the power of also knowing um, this is a real surveillance um, culture, the, from everything to make a name, from the, our phone to MetroCard, et cetera. Um, we are being tracked and traced, and some of us more vulnerable than others. So, so yes, let's, have a, let's get together, do a little, uh, some training, some workshops, some learning together around what that looks like, and what are some of those defense tools that have been created. When I spoke, you know, with Pedro's parents too, we we're like, well, let's communicate through WhatsApp instead, you know, instead of this, and it creates like a 
And we, we acknowledge these are not fully secure or safe. So that also needs to be named when we do these trainings. But, um, but it is a, a little, uh, it's a symbol and a practice of we're taking care of each other. We are aware that we're being attacked, divided in different ways. So this is how we're going to also take care. On 420, we're going to have a digital uh, safety training for youth. Please do do some touch and check in with um, young folks and how they're targeted. Um, help them co-create those spaces and because they do use use it against them. Um, so it's so powerful for young people to know. You know, actually, my audience is uh, the government, the police. It's not just my mom, my tia, or my friends who are who I'm social media chatting with, but it's all of these. And the, you know how I'm gonna share in, in ways that still hold my truths and my power. Um, I'm not gonna fall in their setups, in their traps. I'm not gonna give, a, give them some information that they might wanna use against me, but I'm gonna still stay true to my, my roots. And if I am using that medium as an organizing tool, than I am, that's also what the coalition does. Sometimes, we, yeah, we use Google or Gmail sometimes, or and sometimes we use DuckDuckGo to protect our search, but we do a little bit of both. So find the balance that feels um, still true to your dignity and your power. Um, and there's an organization called Dignity and Power Now, I think that was just a shout out, um, who's also building that culture of healing justice. So they both gotta be there together. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have a question right here. Thank you. Hi. Um, <clears throat> so, first, I want to commend the approach you've taken um, to bring this to life. Uh, I think it's very human centric, and I think it's important. Like you said, there's a big disconnect, but I think with an approach like this, mm -hmm. um, we can really make a difference. Um, so I'm originally from the Democratic Republic of Congo, and I've recently moved here um, a few months ago, and I'm in a big process of unlearning and exposure, which is so essential. And when I'm faced with or exposed to an approach like this, it hits home, because it's not just a name or data, something that's been overused, it's a thing that has been used for as long as I've been alive against my... Um, Okay, I'm gonna get that version out. So initially, I wanted to ask if um, in America there is a space that you could trace um, that is not aware of the data control, right? But then you answered that. You said that there's some people and some places in America that are not aware of the portals. And then throughout your approach, how is the human reaction to one the knowledge, and then two, are you taking some sort of strategy to unlearn that new subjectivity? Because I've been alive for as long as I've lived, I'm unaware of it. And now that I know that unlearning process is vigorous, it's tough, and the majority of where I come from is that new thing. Um, so that's the question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, yes, for all of that. Um, the way that this project started was first, like, let's teach people about data, and then in exchange with our organizations, we'll be, like, collecting the stories and really building relationships. Um, and then it was like, oh, that's not enough, right? And then it was like, okay, let's t teach people tangibly what we are talking about. So that kind of is like where, what's in your wallet section of our playbook. It's like, let's teach people actually how it affects them right now, today. And then it was like, we did that. And it was like, oh, well, that is not enough. Folks were like, all right, we were like, this is what data is. This is how it's being tracked. And folks would be like, shit. <laughs> um, and then we roped into the power, not paranoia piece, right? And around like, 
really thinking about what are our own community tools for self-defense? Like, what are some tools we can, like, use to unlearn in a way that is safe, that we, well, as safe as possible, right? Because safety is an is a idea. Um, and that, like, the way that we could do it together as community, right? And so it kind of happened in that way. We was like, we're going to just teach you about data. And it was like, that is not enough. We are scaring the hell out of our community members who had never understood or had the same language to talk about it, because they always understood, right? Um, and so that's kind of how the playbook came, uh, how our research unfolded, um, which is really important, right? It's like, some, sometimes people want to know the nitty gritty, but also sometimes don't have, people don't have the time. We don't have the time. And so it's like, I just want you to tell me what the thing is, and then tell me what to do, right? So I can feel in control of that. Um, one of my most memorable stories is that we were doing a community walk, like it's called Look Up, um, and some young kids were on the you know, corner surviving, um, and we had just noticed like three or four cameras here, and I was like, yo, come here. And he's like, what you want, da, da, da. I was like, look up, right? And he was like, oh, right? And like, met his friends, was like, look up, you know? And so for me, like, whether or not he continues to do what he does is fine, um, but one, the direct thing around, like, I can tell 10 people to look up right now, right? And then I also can make another decision or opt into how, where I am in relation to, to this technology. And so kind of like, sometimes it's just that simple, um, that sometimes folks want to be putting all of their information out, right? Like, we ask people, what information do you want to share and what information don't you want to share? And most of it, folks is like, I want to share more information about my kids, my family, the things I like and the things that I love. I don't want to share my background or my income level or my social security number. Um, and so it's like, what's a privacy setting, right? Like, oh, you could be private. Have you ever Googled yourself, right? Like, oh, I Googled myself. This is what came up. Let me Google my mother. And then, like, they're calling their mother, like, Ma, I just Googled you. You need to take that picture down. Um, <laughs> and so that is the small, like, incremental change that we, and how we teach people how to, like, protect each other and protect ourselves is already embedded in how, in the culture we create. Um, and so just, like, giving, providing the tools to be able to talk about it in a way that feels good for folks. Um, and so that's kind of, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, thank you. And I also, oh, sorry, offer a resource real quick. Um, Equality Labs has um, a site where they have a, uh, some one sheets on how to like clear your, your data profile in, in different ways, um, how to encrypt your cell phone, how do you, you know, like just the technical aspects of, because these are, what we collected here was the way our community members have been at surviving on and off of these systems. And so once you get into the system, like, like I said in Detroit, most of the people I talk to don't have broadband internet access. And so even while we're trying to organize for people to have access, there's a different way that we're, we get to go from the ground. We're actually in a better place because we get to politicize, educate, and bring access at the same time. But like if you're, if you're already in those systems, there are some tools you can use to minimize some of your data footprint. And so I would recommend Equality Labs for that. Is that, do you know if that's like equalitylabs.org or? Just, if you, if you I think Google it's qualitylabs.org, it. but, but if you, but if you, I hate to say if you Google, but if you, if you duck, duck, go, <laughs> if you look up Equality Labs, though, you can, um, yeah, you'll be able to see their one sheets. Um. Okay, I think we have time for one more question before. Oh, okay, two, two more questions. Why don't you both um, ask your questions and then folks can respond and then we'll have some last um, stuff. Uh, okay. Yeah. Great. Okay, come on up. All the questions. Yeah, let's yeah. just have all the questions, <laughs> and then folks can respond, and then we'll do a little bit of housekeeping to wrap up. Yes. Uh, so the question that I had was in regards to the census. So the census is coming up next year, um, April, of, yeah, 2020, um, and there's a there's like this conversation that we're having, which I love about. Um, uh, communities having access uh, to how their data is given uh, and utilized and this like desire to become more and more invisible i.e. protected internally protected and but how do you um, put that in conversation with the government 
uh, collecting data on the populace, um, you know, in low-income communities, and that like translating into um, lowered representation in government, uh, lower resources, filter to those communities because it's assumed that there aren't as many people in need because these you know, lower income or hard to count communities don't, uh, don't want to be visible for very good reason. So how, do you, how does an organizer put those two things in conversation in an ethical way and how, how might you suggest that like, we go about like, this boots on the ground effort for the census next year or should we? Great question. Yeah, so that's great. So we're we're gonna take all the questions and um, and we'll, that's a huge question. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, let's let's have yeah. Go ahead. Um, so my question is around. Uh, I'm hearing a lot about safety, security. This is it's very like protection focus, which I mean, taking the energy to do that is exhausting enough. Um, but I'm wondering if within teaching and educating within these communities or having these conversations if through greater understanding of the systems at play and the data systems at play, has there been any discussion in your interviews or among communities about using this data for themselves, like not by all the institutions? Um, I'm involved in two organizations that definitely work to encourage voices and representation in these systems to have this data be more useful, like you said, where the kids that you're talking about, the people you're talking about, are actually in the room. Um, so yeah, I'm just curious if that came up, if people realized that these, or thought that this data could be useful for them, rather than focusing purely on how they can be protected from it. Great, thank you thank so you. much. Um, oh, okay, we'll have you and then you and then we'll Okay, I just also want to say thank you all so much for presenting and speaking. So I'm gonna try to make my questions super concise. So I know, I think it also pairs with what this person also just said. Um, so I'm thinking a lot about like the data footprint and just figuring out ways of like, I'm into decolonizing and anti-capitalism like as a practice, right? So how can we or communities of color particularly monetize that sharing of data? So I'm just trying to figure out if you're going into a space how can you say, if there's cameras here, I need to get paid a dollar for every minute this camera's on me. And so, you know, just like how can we really integrate monetizing our, our image? And if, if we don't want the camera on us, then we're just gonna be a blurry image. Like if Google um, Map can make a blurry image in their interface, we can definitely do that with camera footage. So I just wanna figure out how can we really strategic, strategically think about monetizing our shares, like getting shares um, from the data that is like put out by Facebook, like a black share. Mm -hmm. If there's black data that Facebook won, every month I should get like $5 in my account based on that share or data that I accepted Facebook to use. And so I just wanna know whether there's actually, or maybe our data bodies or any other organization that's doing that work to advocate for black bodies or Asian bodies or whatever bodies of color where we are monetizing our sharing of data and utilizing that to give back or incentivize the community of, hey, if you're okay with sharing your data, every month you get $10 for this particular organization that wanna use your data for X, Y, and Z. If not, you have that privilege to go off the books, you know? So just really strategically thinking about ways to really utilize capitalism for its similar rhetoric, but put that money back in us based on the information that we're getting. So that's my question. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Nice. I love that last question. Um, I, I have two. So one is a couple times you all mentioned global connections. So are you working in a global space as well? And, and what does that look like? And secondly, how do you think about the balance between producing a playbook for our communities and then talking back to those figures you, you mentioned, Sita, especially at the beginning, who are thinking in this fairness, accountability, transparency world? Okay, so how much um, time do we have? <laughs> okay, so I just want to, um, we have not much. Well, we have actually some. If, if folks, like basically um, the workshop is going to be ready for folks to start heading up there um, by about 11.30. 
or 11.45, so we do have time. Um, and um, we can also you know, make a space for folks who need to go. Um, but um, I just want to tell, uh, tell you guys what questions we have. Um, and then I'll hand it over to you. But first, I just want to say on the subject of census, that is something that Digital Equity Lab is working on um, intensively. So who was it who asked about census? Yeah, um, very happy to share our work with you. We're currently conducting a risk assessment um, that will produce um, standards, best practices, and guidelines um, for communities that are um, wanting to engage in the census in a, in a safer way. So please, um, please catch up with the Digital Equity Lab on that work, and, and we're also going to be sharing that work with all these folks. Okay, so the other questions are census, positive uses of data. Um, is there a possibility to monetize the sharing of one's own data? Um, what's, what does your work look like on the global stage? Mm -hmm. And I think the last question is basically around like what are the deficiencies of the f fairness and accuracy um, and technology discussion and that sort of discussion that, that sort of puts it in the realm of ethics and academia? And how are you guys, what's, you know, what are you guys adding or how are you guys addressing that deficiency? So um, I'm going to say in about five minutes, I'm going to tell folks who have to leave um, to <laughs> please go ahead and do so. I mean, if you have to leave, of course, you can leave. <laughs> but sorry. But, um, <laughs> but um, we'll, we'll make a, um, an opening that's a little more natural. But um, go ahead and, and um, anybody who wants to take on any of those amazing questions. Well, I just want to synth synthesize real quick. So. Detroit, um, we're going to use the data disco text um, to educate the community on around the census. That's our plan for 2019 and 2020. We've already planned that through the Detroit Digital Justice Coalition, and we'll definitely be tapping um, to uh, with uh, Greta and all the organizing and the politicizing that they're doing around the census. But we, that is our strategy: is to use the data disco text to educate around the census. As far as the um, the monetizing data, there is a guy here named um, James Felton who um, has started a data union and uh, has a data bill bill of rights, and that's the work that they're doing is trying to figure out how to monetize the, uh, the data. And he's available online, and I recommend that you check him out for that information. I think it's um, James Felton Keith. Yeah, yeah. And he has a um, radio show on CCNY's um, yeah. radio station. Yeah, great. Yeah, I just met him recently. He He's a former Detroiter, but now a New Yorker. But, um, but yeah, he's done a lot of work around how to monetize data. Um, 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 yeah, so I'll say the census. Uh, data disco text and oh and uh, go to the resource page uh, Detroit Community Tech resource you can download a zine on how to organize your own disco tech so that you can politicize your community around those things and so um, so part of so if someone asked the how do we use and reclaim data tools for ourselves so a part of this project I use GIS mapping the open data portal from Charlotte and around police um, shootings and murders, and then the re-entry um, zip code data points from the Center for Community Transitions and kind of overlapped all of those data points. And, so, and, and gentrification, right? Like where were the most evictions, um, foreclosures, and use that to really, really tell the true narrative of what was happening in Charlotte around the area codes that were being highly targeted, right, from an economic standpoint, from a policing standpoint, from a re-entry standpoint, um, and a, like some of the dots, eight of them directly overlapped, right? That means that someone returned home and that someone was shot, a police officer shot or murdered someone in that same place, and it was a city or a zip code. It was a zip code that was already being gentrified. And so just like teaching folks how to reclaim the data and really use it to tell the stories. Another thing we're um, piloting is tr using GIS and parcel land for reparations and land reclamation around empty parcels 
that we could use. Um, and so there's different tactics and tools that folks can use with the data that's already available. Um, we just got to figure out what you want to use it for and then don't tell a lot of people. Because um, sometimes the open data portal will change based off how much information I'm downloading and that's real. Um, we are doing global work, which I'm excited to say, yay. Um, and work with other institutions that are heavy academic base and talking about the ethics. So um, I got accepted to be an International Freedoms Fellow and we, we all will be going, except for Tawana, to IFF probably Saturday, um, which is in Spain, which is a global um, conference really talking about data, technology, surveillance um, from a perspective and we will be presenting there. We've been to um, Mozilla Fest, um, CredCon, Tawana and I will be going to RightsCon. Um, and so we're really thinking about how to do that work in a global perspective, because it really shifts and changes the way I even perceive our own surveillance. Um, it's like, oh, we got this, but you know, it's, it's a lot less sometimes. Um, and then working with um, folks who invite us in to actually do some of our workshops, especially with data scientists, I've done two already, um, to really think about the ethical ramifications and the human impacts of the decisions that they're making because sometimes there's just like, I get paid to create the system. It is not my fault and I don't have control over how the people use the system. It's not really my problem. And so really trying to bring, merge the two just so that they'll have some emotional like, oh, I remember I did that workshop and it was like some poor people in North Carolina that got impacted and that's my decision. You know, even if it's only a millisecond and they'll just press the button and go ahead, like at least that we've made that level of intervention. Um, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you all. Uh, oh, uh, thank you. Happy to share. And thanks for listening and hanging out with us. Hope you can join us for the practice space in a little bit, too. Um, I also think about balance when we're thinking about reclaiming tools. I, I really hope that we don't just end up using digital tools for organizing, either. Um, in Los Angeles, I want to uplift Color Coded, a P POC uh, data or, or tech, techie group. They call them, they self-call themselves. Um, and we work with we work with them to think about carceral technologies and abolition technologies. So anytime you're using anything, think about is it helping us um, get more chains, more control? Is it helping us get more free? Um, yeah, there's a, we could use some of, some of those tools for sure, because they're there, they're, we're, we're interacting with them, they're interacting with us by force, so there is some kind of um, coping and figuring what's our engagement with these tools, but I don't want to sway towards a dependency on them. Um, there's, you know, there's ways to get around the land without GPS as well too, so it's, it's you know, checking in with your choices that you make every day, thinking about the complicity that we have by just being on this land and what are we going to do. Um, and the, the census and the monetary piece are really great questions. I would recommend sessioning those question in, questions with um, a, more, a group of folks that you, you, you imagine co-working them through, like Tawana was mentioning. Um, but the census is the government doing a, a recount, a reassessment. They already have all that information, so it'll be important in, in our ODB work to look at how, what are the census questions? How are they being rolled out? Etc. who's going to have that information. We already know who and how they're going to share it. So there has to be more than protection, like somebody was naming the, exhaust, the exhaustion of that. But what are we creating? What are we uh, we're resisting or defending? But we also got to be creating. So I, I love your creativity in that idea. Um, for me, I think about reparations when you said that on a framework, you know, thinking my image, my body is being st taken from, stolen, and criminalized on top of that. So I, give, give me some of, give me back, um, yeah. So that makes sense to me in a reparations framework and, and to not fall again into the, the line of exploitation um, capitalism either. But, but um, we do get creative when, we, when we're getting free and we have every right to get De divest and defund from, from the military state of it all and um, invest in, in livelihood and, and yeah. Okay, so we're, we are running out of Kim time and I, I know I want to um, 
hand it over to Kim and yeah. then to Sita, Sweet. and then I'll, I'll wrap it up. Thank you. Um, in the meantime, could you guys please put up the info for the playbook? Um, thank you so much. So um, as um, Kim and Sita talk, and then I'll give some final instructions, um, please take a look. And this is how you can get your own copy of the playbook. So Kim, go ahead. Um, just to be super concise, um, just to kind of build off what Tamika had talked about in terms of the international aspect, I think the strength of the work is, is both being very specific, so we know like in the states that each state is actually highly, highly specific around data collection. Each state has its own kind of apparatus, especially even around if we talk about like re-entry, like each, each state, even counties can differ, differ in terms of, okay, what, which misdemeanor, which crime did you commit, okay? How do you reapply? Is it reinstated immediately in terms of voting? What uh, public services can you apply for? All these different things. So I think in international space, it's interesting to have that high specificity um, because it does paint a good picture of what's going on. But I do think that someone had asked about the um, advantages of storytelling. And I think that's also where our work comes in in terms of relating it to an international perspective. So um, myself and Sita are also ba we, we aren't based are in the US at the moment. So I'm based in uh, Cape Town, South Africa. And it also just came out a few months ago that there was widespread um, widespread surveillance and um, what's it called when you implement people? You plant people in there to spy on people? What's it called? Infiltration. Yeah, like the spies. infiltration spies. There's, there was a lot of spying. Yeah, there's spying going on um, with the Roads Must Fall and Fees Must Fall movement, which were huge student and political movements that happened from 2015 to 2017. Um, so when we think about the things that happen in Ferguson, or things that happen in Charlotte, things that happen in Detroit, all these different things that we can point to, they're happening globally as well. So like, it can help us understand how do we organize, how do we, how do we organize, what, is, what are technologies we can use to move outside of Facebook sometimes, because that's obviously a huge go-to for the police, and that's largely what happened in, in, in South Africa, in Joburg, Cape Town, KZ, and all these different places. So yeah. Very quickly, um, I'll just point out there was a really fantastic um, academic workshop called Algorithmic Discrimination and Intersectionality. And it took place, I feel like I'm really bad with time, 2017, December. And it's, I think, a great example of where some of these conversations can start to enter into academic discourse and make a difference. So I'll just say that, that there is movement within the academic space to really challenge the vantage point from which we start when engaging these questions. Fantastic. Well, thank you all so much um, for being here. And thank you, ODB.